So, uh, housekeeping. Uh, first thing, next Friday there's what? A test. All right. So it will cover the material that we um, don't cover on the quiz. Some of it will be the same. Some of it will be different. The quiz is to kind of get you to study and all of that. I left nomenclature off of the quiz to give you a little more time to practice that. Okay, just let you know that. And, and the first key in nomenclature, if you're struggling with it, is learning to identify which naming system you're going to use. So that means you have to use the periodic table to identify what the molecule is. You guys with me? It's the, that's the key, and you're saying, what do you mean? Well, we, use, we learned three, three different systems, right? We learned uh, two different for uh, non-metals, okay, or molecular bonding, or covalent bonding, and those two systems were small hydrocarbons, and we learned uh, 10 prefixes and four suffixes. Right, and but you have to do. How do you know when you have a hydro a hydrocarbon molecule? How do you identify that? What two elements going to be present? Hydrogen and carbon. Hydrogen and carbon. And so when you see those two together, you use a different naming system than when you see other nonmetals together. When you have other nonmetals together, that's considered an inorganic compound. It's an inorganic molecular compound. And so, for example, if I put nitrogen and oxygen together then I use the molecular naming system, right? The uh, bimolecular, two atoms, two different types of atoms, and then we <coughs> use the number prefixes to identify how many of each that are present, right? So dinitrogen, pentoxide, or something like that. You guys with me? Yeah. What's the third system? What's the third naming system? Ionic, Ionic right? And so to identify when you have an ionic compound, what's the usual key giveaway? What are most ionic compounds? A uh, non-metal combined with a metal. Which one's always listed first? The metal's always listed first, okay? So it'll be a metal, non-metal. Now it can also be a positive polyatomic ion like the ammonium ion, okay? And on the anion side, it could be either a single element, and those are easy, they have the IDE suffix, just like in the uh, molecular system, but I could have a polyatomic ion, and we learned some of those, the eights, the ites, the hypoites, and the purates, right? And so we learned those, and you should be able to identify them, okay? Now, for these first tests, if there's one you just can't get, if you'll come down and ask, I'll often give those to you, just like if you can't remember a conversion, uh, but you know how to do the conversion, come get the conversion from me. I'll give it to you. If I give it to you, I'll write it on the board usually. So you're helping other people are sitting up there going, oh my gosh, I can't remember what that is. Okay, so just letting you know that I know you're beginning to learn this. This is a quiz, right? Now for a test, I, I'm a little less giving. Does that make sense? But these are practice, these are warm up. But now with the test, I also let you do a redo. Okay, so for half the points that you missed. So you have an opportunity to re an opportunity to redeem yourself. But what I'm doing that in that is I'm making you go to the book and you have to give a book reference. When you do the answer and you have to tell me why you missed it, what's wrong with your answer, and why the new answer is correct. So it's not just giving me the new answer, you have to do some work with that. You have to do some practice. Okay, and you're specifically practicing those things that you didn't know how to do, is my intention, right? So trying to build your skills. Um, I finally got through the handouts. Um, I felt like I was cleaning my garage at home, you know, where you take everything outside and then you have to put everything back and you change the way you organize everything and, and that's what it felt like. But um, it is much more manageable. It's in 16 uh, units. And I may shift some stuff around as the semester goes if we hit a little bit different timing, but at least I have a basic structure there for you. It's much easier and cleaner to follow. And so uh, forgive me for taking so long, but gosh, it was a lot of work for me. Um, I worked overtime yesterday just to get that done. Um, so anyway, uh, for both sections. Um, anyway, uh, other things, all right. Lab, lab this week, you guys uh, did some measurements, okay? 
and so you took some measurements and what you did was you measured some 2,4 pentadiome or pentane diome and some water and you put those in in varying ratios right you guys with me and then you heated it up till they mixed and you let it start cooling down and when they started to unmix it became cloudy and you recorded that temperature right with me so up here on the board i have the volumes that were mixed and i have the temperatures now i left a gap between because i'm going to do a calculated column right there called the volume fraction okay now i recommend you do this in excel right because you can do math in excel and so i want you to start learning how to do math with excel and write formulas but if i'm writing this formula i would write equals okay and what i want to do is i want to take a3 right a3 is my 24 pentane diode volume okay and then i want to divide that by what what's the how do i calculate the fraction the amount of 24 pentane diode plus the amount of water right the total volume and so to get that, then I would close my parenthesis, or oh, start a parenthesis, and I would do A3 plus B3. Okay, cool. And so when I hit enter, then my volume fraction is calculated. Now, what's even better is I don't have to write that formula again. All you have to do is go back to the number and you see the little dot right there in the corner of the green dot. Can you guys make that out from your seat? If you'll put that on there and it makes the, the black cross and you will drag that down across your data, then it will calculate all those. It basically just moves the formula down. This one now is calculating A4, A4 plus B4, right? And then the next one is A5 divided by A5 plus B5. You guys with me? So now I've got all of the volume fractions calculated. I want to do a graph. Okay, now you notice this last one has that non-determined on it. Okay, cool. You guys with me? And so I'm not going to pick that point. Right? I can't plot it. It doesn't have a place to plot. Right? But I'm going to show you something cool that you can do mathematically and we can predict where that would happen at. Okay? So but I'm gonna go and same thing, I'm gonna select my data. I have it set up X and Y, um, so it's gonna plot appropriately. And I go to insert, and what type of plot are we going to use? Yeah. Scattered, look for the dots, and I want no line, I just want the points, okay? Because we're gonna fit a line to this. And so if I do that, then here's my data, okay? now. I have a question. Our volume fraction is changing in a fairly linear fashion, isn't it? So would you expect the results of the data to be linear? Yes, but if you read the handout information, and for example, let's open the handout for just to open it up for just a second. Um, So if we scroll down through this, do the nice photos. Um, some of them aren't loading, but anyway, I want to look at this graph right here. Okay. Um, right now it's bumped off the page, so let's go to the other one. Man, that's thinking right there. Um, if I look at this graph, this is a, a volume percent. Is the volume percent like a volume fraction? It, all it is, the only difference is it's multiplied times 100, right? You guys with me? And so this could be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 if it were done by fraction, okay? Now, if I'm looking at this, this is changing in a linear fashion, but what's happening to the freezing point? It's decreasing in a non-linear fashion, isn't it? And so this is an example of the same type of thing that we're seeing with our data. The, though we changed the fraction in a linear fashion, we got a nonlinear response. 
which is actually normal for colligative properties. Okay, so that's a word that you guys may not have heard yet, but when I mix two things, then it changes their property from each individual to something new. Okay, and so one is freezing point depression. And so if I'm looking at the freezing point, well, this is antifreeze. You guys ever heard of antifreeze? Ethylene glycol mixed with water. And so this graph is very useful in that it can predict where I can get the lowest temperatures without freezing. If I live in Barrow, Alaska, then I want to be somewhere between 60 and 80 percent ethylene glycol and 40 and 20 percent water because temperatures there get to negative 50 sometimes. You guys with me? And so th is this useful? It is, isn't it? So now I know a ratio that works well. If we're in the Ozarks, you can use a lot less um, ethylene glycol as long as we get down here into, well, let's say what, negative 10 is about the coldest it ever gets here in the Ozarks. In my 55 years, I remember one negative, I can't, I can't remember, it's 14 or 15, one night in the past 50 years, right? And not very often below negative five, okay? Probably a handful of times, all right? So we can mix antifreeze associated with what temperature we need, okay? Now back when I was farming, I truly did not understand this. I didn't understand why if a little bit of ethylene glycol was good, why a lot wouldn't be better, right? And so why aren't we putting 100% in? Well, because the freezing point for 100% ethylene glycol is about 12 degrees, right? 10 degrees. So does it get to 10 degrees in the Ozarks? Yeah, so it would freeze my radiator. Now, it wouldn't expand like water does and break it, okay? But what would happen is you wouldn't get any flow and as soon as you fired the engine up then because you didn't get any water flow, the cylinder walls would get hot and you would burn holes in them. All right? Bye-bye motor. Bye-bye motor, yeah. And so understanding these types of things is useful. You guys are building a phase diagram, right? And there's a trend. And so if we're looking at that, do you guys see the trend? Yeah, well, we can fit a line to that. And so just like we did with the linear trend line, you're gonna add a trend line. And now does that linear fit very well? Not at all. Not at all. We can actually go down and get our um, equation and our R and our R tells us how well it fits. A good fit is one, right? A perfect fit is one. Um, anything above 0.95, I'm, we're starting to fit pretty good. So what I can do is change the type of line, right? And so I can go to what's called a polynomial. You guys know polynomials, right? So instead of just X, it's got X squared is the one we're looking at right now. And look at that, 0 0.9841, that's a pretty good fit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Or if I go to a cubic, then I get to 0.9999. That's a really good fit, isn't it? So that really fits the data, cool? All right, so now I've got my line fit to it, and then I wanna add my chart titles. Remember you use the green cross to add axis titles and your chart title. And I'm gonna go to this other one that's already done. I already have one over here. Um, and let's pull this down just a little bit so we can see it. And so here's my graph. Um, I probably would maybe cut it up to uh, temperature 40, I don't know. Um, it's up to you, whatever you wanna do, but volume fraction of 2,4 pentane dion and temperature degree C, and then some title that would fit with that. Okay, does that make sense, you guys with me? So I, this is something you're gonna staple with the lab and turn into me that's completed. But now, I've done something else, okay? And so if I go over here and I click on this number, right, if you'll notice there's 14, this equals, it's a calculation, okay? And it equals 1413.6 times DA. All right, what's DA? The volume fraction for what? Non the non-determined number, right? You guys with me? And so then, well, where, that's coming from this equation right here, right? That's the best fit equation that was determined by mathematics. 
And so what I did was I went and plugged in the X value, 0 0.09839 for each one of those X's, did the appropriate powers, and then allowed it to calculate. What do we see? When would it become immiscible and become cloudy for this mixture? Negative 17. Does that explain why it doesn't, doesn't come by? Yeah, because if we follow that same trend and it continues to curve down, then it would go to that place. Now, what would probably happen at ne negative 17? It might freeze. Would that change what's going on? Yeah, so I don't know how much the freezing point of the water is depressed, right? But it's very possible at that cold temperature it might freeze. So this may not be true, but it, it's a prediction that we can make. Now, what is this prediction called that I just did? There's a name for it. It's called extrapolation. You guys ever heard of extrapolation? We did a mathematical extrapolation of a, of a curve, a polynomial curve, to predict where data was going to end up. We do this a lot in science, okay? We either extrapolate to see where it's going, or we interpolate. And so as an analytical chemist, I build calibration curves all the time, and I do the same thing with those um, numbers that I want to know the, the Y value for, or more often when I'm doing analytical chemistry, I know the Y value, and I'm looking for the concentration, which is on the X, okay? And so I interpolate between, I take that, that formula, and I plug in my Y value and solve for X. Now, that's really hard with the cubic equation. I'll just tell you that right now. Okay? So when we're doing calibration, then we want to use a linear line if we can. Okay? But we'll get there on that. So interpolation and extrapolation, two words I want you to know for this course. And you saw an example of it being used there. Okay? So your questions ask, well, what can you predict with it? Right? You can extrapolate to predict where the curve is going, or you can interpolate to find a place between to predict that fraction that you would mix to get that temperature, that change at that temperature. Okay? So just throwing those out there. Helpful? All right. Any other housekeeping for this week? Any other housekeeping? What's that? Oh, the word the, the there is, for those of you who have not had lab uh, or had a lab on Tuesday, um, we started turning stuff back. And to turn things back for general chemistry, I use a filing cabinet in the laboratory room. It's in the corner by the balance room, okay? So if this is the lab right here, it's in the back right corner when you go in the door, right behind the, the two fume, humans there. And if you pull out the top drawer, there is a folder with your name on it, okay? And all your work, the quiz that you're going to take today, hopefully will be in there by Tuesday of next week, okay? So you'll have it to study with for the test. Um, we're gonna start grading it this afternoon, maybe it'd be sooner, but we will return all of your work there, okay? The first lab has been returned there. There's a, hand, a bottle of hand sanitizer there so that you can clean your hands after you touch the door if you like. And that's where you're gonna get your stuff, cool? All right, it's easier for us to do it that way. We just send someone in and file.